today as we come to the table. When I'm reading the vows, for better or for worse, I kind of look, you know, like, do you know what you're saying? Because I think what we hear, I know what I tended to hear that day was for better or for better. You're not, you're not thinking about the worst. Your mind's not there, but there's going to be those times of hardship. It's reality. We're people and we're sinners and it's going to be there. And yet what happens when we get to this place, when we get to the worst, what do we do? We start wanting to bolt. We start wanting some kind of exit. It's that human nature to avoid pain and to avoid hurt. But God says, no, listen, you need to stay right there and let me do what I'm doing. I'm molding, I'm shaping, and I'm going to use this in your life. And so again, a marriage, you know, it's a very special thing in a lot of reasons. And it gives us the picture of why the wedding is also so special to the Lord. We humans have a tendency to expect only good things to happen to us. We always expect good things and ignore bad things, whether at work or in relationships, even in marriage. We tend to be happy with our spouse when things are going well. But when things don't go as planned, we abandon our spouse to deal with the situation. What can we do to change this? Today, Pastor Mark tells you how you can overcome this runaway attitude by relying on God. Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table. The Daily Bible Study Program of Mark Kirk, Senior Pastor of Calvary Knoxville. Unexpected situations will always arise in your relationship, but God wants you to stick together and allow Him to work miracles in your lives and solve every problem. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Genesis chapter 2 with today's edition of Come to the Table. we continue on working through Genesis, we'll finish chapter 2 today. And, and for a running go's sake, we're only going to really be doing verses 22 through 25 today, but we really need 21 to give us kind of the context here. So why don't we look together at uh, chapter 2, verse 21. We'll read that all, and then we'll go back and look at those last few verses more closely. Notice it says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. And then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And Adam said, now this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Father, how we thank you for your word. Lord, how we need instruction in marriage. Lord, I, I say with a, a heavy heart, I know there are probably marriages here that are struggling right now, as well as marriages that are probably somewhere about in the middle and marriages right now that are just doing wonderfully. And so I know that as we have this wide variety of people and marriages, Lord, I thank you that your spirit is able to minister to each one right where they are. Lord, for those that are struggling in their marriage, you have hope and encouragement today. Or those whose marriage is in that middle ground area that today you might do a a strengthening God to help them to realize the need to maybe tighten things up even more. And for those that are really have the marriage just humming along right now, God, we pray you continue to bless and continue just to do a great work there. But Lord, all of us are going to be in one of those places at one time or another. And so we need your word. We need your instruction manual to let us know how we're supposed to live, how we're supposed to interact in our marriages, and, and Lord, just how we're supposed to be as husband and wife. And God, I pray that for those here today that aren't married and maybe even have quite some time before they will be, that you would use your word to minister to their hearts and prepare them for that day so that we are equipped, Lord, and ready for what you intended marriage to be and for the life that you so desire to have, Lord, with us through marriage. We love you, Lord, and we ask your blessing now that we ask you to teach us by your Holy Spirit and that you would pour out your spirit on us today as we get into your word and, Lord, just look to you. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Today we look at the world's first wedding. You know, it's, a wedding is a very special event for a number of reasons. Uh, number one, it's the joining of two people who love each other very much and have decided to commit their lives together. Now that alone is very exciting. 
Two people meet and they want to live their lives together. It's a wonderful thing that God has designed. And so there's this love relationship and we rejoice in a wedding for that very reason. It's exciting. But that's only one of the reasons. There are many different reasons for marriage. And we've talked again about the ultimate reasons last week. But also it's establishing a new life together. You know, there are different seasons in our life. We have a season of growing up as a child and then through the uh, high school years and college years and then sometime there for most of us we get married. Some people are called to singleness and remember we said don't worry if you have any desire to get married you're not called to that. I think that's a very rare, very rare calling. The majority of us, probably some 98% or 95 or more you know, are called to be married. And so we enter into this season now, different seasons of life, then we enter into a season of marriage. And God uses each of these seasons to grow us and mature us and do things in our life. You know, it's interesting. As I look back over my life, I can see how God was doing things in different seasons. And I remember when I got married, there was a whole new way of life I had to learn now. I mean, I, you get married and, and suddenly this everything changes, you know. I thought that, you know, you just get married and now you have a wife. But I realized, no, you get married and she needs a husband. And so there's these things that begin to change. And I say that in a positive way, a good way. It was a rough lesson to learn. I think I went rather naively into marriage in some ways. And in some ways I was well equipped. But either way, I think a lot of us go naively into marriage. And I remember hearing one guy just recently saying that he had no idea what he was saying at the altar. He was joking about it, you know, and saying, I, you know, I was a young kid and she was beautiful and I wanted to get married. And I didn't know what betrothed meant. And I was just, you know, I didn't realize that now everything I had was hers. And I had to like be home and stuff. And, you know, and I, I, he said, this isn't what I bargained for, you know. <laughs> But the bottom line is, is that God uses that. God takes that and says, all right, now it's a new time of maturity. There's a new time of growth. There's a new season of change there. And God uses these different seasons, marriage being one of them. And as we said last week, one of the main reasons that makes a wedding special or a marriage special is because it gives us a visible example of the relationship that God desires with us, his bride, the church, and as showing the picture of a husband with his wife. So a wedding is also an exciting time in that we are now joined in the most intimate way that, that one can and, and where we can love at the highest level. You know, there's a greater intimacy that comes with marriage. It's, it's not just in the physical way, but in the emotional way, in the psychological way, and, and even in the spirit. There's something mystical that happens. The Bible says, as we'll see today, when the two get married, they become one. And yes, there's some physical application, but there's the spiritual application above all to that. There's a connection that happens in the spiritual realm where you become linked together. And that's why when you see things such as divorce, and God says, you know, he hates divorce. And again, for those of you that come from a painful background of that, this is not to make you feel bad, but just to speak of God's word saying the reason he hates divorce is because there is this union that comes together, not only physically, but spiritually. And when it's torn apart, it brings great hurt and great damage and great destruction. It's just something that, you know, can't be avoided. And that's why God says it's a very exciting thing. And if it's applied the right way and we use it the proper way, it's a very beautiful thing. And again, I think one of the reasons that we struggle in our marriages, and all of us do, and I just want to be the first to say as your pastor, I know that it's odd to sometimes be encouraged by other people's failures. But we're, we're a strange lot at times, and I think sometimes people think the pastor doesn't have struggles and that his marriage is, you know, never uh, rough or this kind of thing or whatever. But all of us go through times of hardness in our marriage and times of blessing in our marriage, and God uses it to stretch us and to grow us. You know, again, we stand at the altar, and what do we say? And I hear this all the time, you know, for better or for worse is one that really sticks out in my mind. When I'm reading the vows, for better or for worse, I kind of look, you know, like, do you know what you're saying? Because I think what we hear, I know what I tended to hear that day was for better or for better. You're not, you're not thinking about the worst. Your mind's not there, but there's going to be those times of hardship. It's reality. We're people and we're sinners and it's going to be there. And yet what happens when we get to this place where we get to the worst, what do we do? We start wanting to bolt. We start wanting some kind of exit. It's that human nature to avoid pain and to avoid hurt. But God says, no, listen, you need to stay right there and let me do what I'm doing. I'm molding, I'm shaping, and I'm going to use this in your life. And so, again, a marriage you know, it's a very special thing in a lot of reasons. And it gives us the picture of why the wedding is also so special to the Lord. Because when you think about it, you know, God has joined these two people in the most intimate way they can, but it's a picture of what he's waiting on. He's waiting on the day that he has his bride, the day that he celebrates with the wedding feast, and now he's going to be joined. He comes back in the second coming, and the father presents the bride to the son. And there's this beautiful picture he's given us in a physical way of this spiritual eternity that we're going to be living with him. And you know, again, on the times when the marriage is really, you know, humming and doing good, you think about it on the earthly level, what's it going to be like in the spiritual realm? How much better will it be with the Lord as his bride than it is down here now with our earthly relationship that we have? But again, we see that it's a very special thing to the Lord because it's a symbol to him of his bride one day walking down that aisle at the second coming, so to speak, and standing before the throne and, and the rewards being given and being joined and entering into this wedding feast and all the joy that's going to come with that. So it's a very special thing. A wedding is ordained of God. 
And the marriage is ordained of God. It's beautiful when it's done in the right way. And again, in line with the instruction manual. And I think that one of the things that we do when it comes to marriage that really messes us up, and let me just say this, even if you do things right, you know, if you use the instructions and put together whatever you purchase the right way, you're still going to have problems with it from time to time, aren't you? You can have everything assembled just right with your car, but you know, there's going to be sometimes something's going to break. A tire's going to go flat, you know, or, or something's going to, uh, there's going to be a knocking noise. You're going to have to maintain that. And the same thing is true with marriage is you're going to have, even if you build the marriage the right way, there's going to be the tough times. But here's where the toughest part of marriage comes in, I think, for Americans and probably around the world is that we don't use the instruction manual. This is God's instruction manual. He knows how we're built. He knows what will make a marriage work. He knows what won't make a marriage work. And the most devastating, we can do, devastating thing we can do is decide we're not going to look at the instruction manual and we're just going to, you know, make this thing work. I mean, dads, you know what that's like at Christmas time. You know, I don't know what it is about a dad. You know, it's the same thing when you're driving. You know, it's like you're already a thousand miles off course. Your wife is very wisely saying stop and ask directions. But no, you're the man. We'll go another thousand miles and then pull over because I think I can find my way out of this. There's something about us we want to try to find out without getting direction, especially as men. And so when we go to the instructions, you know, on the morning of Christmas or whatever, we put this in together. And if you're like me, I always pop those things in that like are irreversible. You ever done that? Husbands, dads, there's that one thing that says you do all this stuff and it looks so logical. So you do it, and you get to the end, it says, now, don't, whatever you do, caution, don't snap A into B until everything's tightened. And you look up, and A and B have been snapped like eight steps ago. Well, now, you know what you have to do? You have to half break the thing now to take it apart somehow and re-fix it to get it to work. Guys, that's how we do our marriages oftentimes. You know, we're putting it together in a way that God didn't design it to be put together, and then we find out, well, why is our marriage such a wreck? Why is everything so hard? Now, there's, listen, when the marriage is done the right way, it's hard enough at times. But when a marriage is done the wrong way, just add the, it's exponential, the problems that come in. And so God says, I want you know, to help you with that. I, I've designed it. I know what works. Listen to me in my word, and I will you know, show you what to do with the word of God and how to apply it in your marriage. Now, again, there's something even more special about this first wedding. And, and again, it's not that different from other weddings. But what's really special about this wedding is in, in the one we see today with Adam and Eve getting married. It not only lays the foundation for all following marriage, but God himself is the one officiating. How would you like that? God's your pastor, you know. And, and again, ultimately, he is, isn't he? Now, the pastor, we officiate today when somebody gets married. But here's the exciting thing to realize. God is still officiating. He's still officiating through the pastor. And God is still directing it. He's still the one that's, you know, getting this thing started and receiving and taking the vows. And so the, the minister conducts all this stuff, but it's really the, the pastor that, I mean, it's really the Lord that's making sure that that's receiving the vows and the vows are being said to him. And so the Christian wedding becomes this blessing here where God says, I hear what you're doing and, I, and I'm a part of it. Now, Genesis is the book of beginnings. And so even as we see all the first things in the book of Genesis, marriage is one of the things we see. This is the first marriage. But understand this, it's how marriages are to be from this point on. God is laying the foundation saying, here's how marriage is to be. A man and wife is to be joined together. And here are going to be the rules we're going to see that God lays out for us to follow to make a successful marriage. And so, but I think the other thing we need to realize is that God is at our marriage. And if we allow the Lord in, he is a part of our wedding. And when we take those vows before the altar, guys, it's not just vows we're taking with our husband or our wife. These are vows that we're making before God. And even as God was overseeing Adam and Eve's wedding, God is overseeing our marriage and, and many of us in our weddings if it was done in the Lord, the marriage ceremony. I mean, did you realize that when you got married that not only was God there, but he was agreeing with and ratifying the vows you were making with your spouse? Think about that. That's heavy duty. It's not just saying, well, I'm making this commitment to her. No, we're saying, God, we're making this commitment to you and before you. And this is where the for better or worse comes in. Because again, when that worst time hits, and it will in every marriage, we have to realize, you know what? I'm not going anywhere. Because this is a vow that I not only made to my bride or my husband, this is a vow that I've made to the Lord. And so this is why our marriage vows are never to be taken lightly, because God doesn't take them lightly. And I think Adam and Eve would have had a very good understanding of how serious the situation was when they were doing this. But our, in our society today, it's very obvious that we don't. And I think that's very clearly reflected in the divorce rate. We don't realize the seriousness of taking these vows before the Lord. I think it's very healthy for every Christian to truly understand that not only are we making a commitment to our spouse, but we are making a commitment and a vow to God. And before the throne of God, and he takes it seriously, and so we should do that as well. You know, it's interesting. To God, there's no such thing as irreconcilable differences. It doesn't exist scripturally. 
God says there are going to be hard times. There are going to be things you don't agree about. As a matter of fact, many of these irreconcilable differences that are often noted as the reason for divorce are often designed by God that you might change from the person you are to a new one. See, by saying God some, God will give us a wife, that if there's an area in our life that needs to change. And God says, I'm going to give you, you never, you're not going to listen to anybody, but you'll listen to her. You know, and so I'm going to put her in your life. She's going to have your ear and that influence, and I'm going to bring out some areas that are going to be very difficult, and she's going to bring them up. I want you to change. And what do we do? So I don't want to change. It's irreconcilable. I quit. And God says, no, you're misunderstanding the whole point. The whole point is I brought you together with things that seem maybe irreconcilable to you so that I can now reconcile not only the marriage relationship, but I can reconcile you into a complete person, a whole person, make you who it is that I designed you to be and who I want you to be. And so understand it's oftentimes God's plan to do this. Our choice is simply are we going to obey or disobey? It's not a matter of whether it can be reconciled. It's a matter of, all right, here's what God asked me to do. Am I going to do it or not? And I've seen couples decide, not going to do it. I'm just going to just choose to disobey God, and they do. And the consequences are devastating. And then I've seen other couples that seem like, well, I don't see how there's any way, but I'm just going to obey God and watch what he does. And then see marriages restored. And see God do something beautiful. What does the Bible say? He takes ashes and makes it into beauty. This is what our God does. Remember, God is a God of resurrection. He takes the, but our marriage is dead, Pastor. I mean, Mark, it's dead. You don't understand. It's dead. There is nothing that's dead. Jesus Christ was too in the grave at least in bodily form, and he resurrected by the power of God, which means God can take your marriage, although it may seem dead, and resurrect it by the power of God. That's what God does. Now, again here, we're going to break this up in two parts today as we look at this. First of all, we're going to look at the actual wedding ceremony where God joins the two together, and we see Adam again taking his vows. And then we're going to look lastly today at the foundation of marriage. And so we're going to see God not just get them married, but then God say, you know what, now you're married. He didn't say, good luck. You know, let's go to verse, I mean, chapter 3 now. You know, he said, no, here's what I want you to do. Here's the foundation for marriage. And we might even get next week a little bit into Ephesians and kind of take this a little bit farther. We'll see whether we go back and forth between Genesis and Ephesians next week or not. We may veer a little bit in order to look at some more instruction because some of this you're going to hear and some of this stuff is like, you know, Lord, I know I'm not where I need to be in, in my marriage or whatever the case might be, but now what? And so we're going to be getting into more of the now what, so don't worry. But God was concerned with the now what is where as well. And that is, he gets them married and then says, now I want you to know how this thing is supposed to work. Here's the instruction manual. But make sure that you apply it. Make sure that you use it so you don't get to step eight and find out you've messed something up back on step one. Notice what he says here. Again, speaking to Adam, you remember the context. Adam has now been created. He's named the animals. And, and as it says, there was no helper found comparable to Adam. And again, it says in verse 21, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. And he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. And it says, then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. What a beautiful picture here of the wedding ceremony. Now notice this, it begins, so to speak. You've seen weddings, you've been in weddings, and what happens in the wedding? Everybody gathers, and there you are, and then the father, at the end, brings the, the bride down the aisle to present to the son. And again, we see the beautiful picture where these traditions come from as God's established this as his foundation, as the way things are supposed to be. Now we see the father taking Eve, creating Eve, taking his daughter, and now bringing Eve down the aisle, if you will, to be joined to Adam here. And you can imagine as he did this, you know, notice there in verse 23, he says, Adam said, now, and again, this is really kind of more of the vows, if you want to look at it in that sense of where Adam speaks of this commitment that he makes to her. He says, now this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Now it's interesting. Remember, he'd been seeing all these animals. And he's been naming all these animals and stuff. He's saying, that's not it, that's not it, that's not it. And you know that God had been working to show Adam that he wasn't complete in some form and fashion. And so now all of a sudden, you know, this bride, God brings Eve. It's like, whoa. And I'll tell you, at weddings, I have a real good shot of the bride coming in. When I get to do a wedding, I see them really good. And, and you've heard it say that all brides are beautiful. It is absolutely true. There is something that I think that God does something special, I think, on that day where this just almost this kind of glow or this radiating of a bride. And you think about the man there and the husband, you know, and he sees the bride coming down. He's like, wow, you know, and, and again, half the time, I don't know if they really understand the commitment they're entering into. At that point, they can't think of anything, but wow. You know what it says here that Adam said, you know, she shall be called woman. I wonder if it was like, she shall be called, whoa, man. You know, I don't know. But the bottom line is, is that, you know, she was beautiful to Adam and all of his senses were alive. And here comes he saying, now this is it. I've seen the animals. Didn't cut it. 
This is now flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. This she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. It comes with the idea, now this is the one like me. That's the idea. This, and you know what it's like when you meet the one that God has for you? Just, it just clicks. You remember, you know, again, that God would spare us from going through the dating years. And I believe that God's design is that we wait on the Lord. We talked about that. And wait on the Lord to bring us. I think God can pick a spouse for us much better than we can. What do you think? And yet, many of us have been through those dating years. But if you've been through those dating years, your mirror was like, you, it's like, no, no, no. It's like everything's hard, you know, and you have to be a certain way. And you're trying to whatever, and it's uncomfortable. And then you meet that person. And, you know, they don't care if your hair's messed up. They don't care if you have hair. They love you. They just love you. You you just get together, and there's this, wow. And you don't have to, like, come up with conversation. You can even sit and be quiet, and it's okay. Matter of fact, it's nice sometimes, right? (laughs) Just be quiet. Let's just sit. That's the bottom line. God does it that way. See, that's God's design. He's got somebody that's perfectly designed for us, and that's what he did for Adam. He's like, I've got someone that's just perfect for you. I, I picked her. I created her. I'm going to bring her to you at the proper time, and now here she is, and we see Adam going, yes, this is, I will call her woman here, and it's interesting. God now gives Adam the honor of naming the woman, even as God gave him the honor of, of naming the animals, and so it's interesting to me that still today, the man gives his wife his name. It's God's design from the beginning. It's almost this way of, of the wife saying, you know what, I'm yours, and God has created me for you, and I'm here to be, come alongside you and to be your helper, and now I take your name. I've become part of the family, so to speak. There's this family. And by the way, a scriptural family is just a husband and wife. The Bible doesn't say a family is kids. The Bible said after he created man and woman, he said, it's good. That was a complete family. So don't ever think because you don't have kids, you're not a complete family. You are. Now, if you want to add to your family, you can do that. And that's a blessing. And God says children are a blessing. But if children do not make a family, a family is a husband and wife by God's ordained design. Children are an addition to that family. But it's interesting to me that she takes the wife's name, or rather takes the husband's name, the wife takes the name, you know, and, and we still see that done today. And again, I think that it's the same thing even we do with the Lord. What a beautiful picture. When we give our life to the Lord, we take his name, so to speak. And the Lord said, you shall not take the Lord's name, what? In vain. I think a lot of times we think that that just means don't say, you know, God in a wrong way, or Jesus in a wrong way, or Lord in a wrong way, but to use it in the proper way. And I do believe there's an application there. Don't get me wrong. But I think the deeper meaning of that is, look, you've taken on the Lord's name. Don't take that in vain. Don't just live as the world lives. Realize that you've got a position of honor now. Live as unto the Lord. And so now you're His. You belong to Him. You've taken His name. And by taking His name, you know, can you imagine you know, not telling the Lord, you know, I want to give my life to you, but I don't want to take your name. And so we see this picture here of of more than just the actual name. The name represents, you're actually saying, I'm yours. So it's as if a wife is saying, I'm now yours. And of course, the husband is saying, I'm yours as well. But there's this union together. There's not this individual unity. I'm here and you're there. And one of the most devastating things a marriage can ever have is one is here and one is there. They each have their individual life. We weren't called to live individual lives in marriage. We've become one. We're called to share our lives. We're called to speak about, you know, the things that are in our heart and and to bounce this back and forth and to be one together in every area. It's always a blessing to have you come to the table of God's Word with us each and every day. Pastor Mark's been going through the book of Genesis, and there's much to learn and appreciate from this first book of the Bible. Sometimes to fully grasp something later on, you need to understand where things began. From verse 1, God made it clear that He was there all along, and He set things in motion exactly as He instructed. Isn't it neat to see that all of creation is under God's authority? That includes you. This could seem a bit intimidating, but it's actually God's way of looking out for your best interests. Once you look at it that way, you start to realize that everything in all of creation is something that God initiated with intention, and that includes you. What a great thing to come to today. If you missed any part of this message or would like to hear this one again, you can always go back and find it at thewaymedia.net. Just click on the Come to the Table tab. Another way to access these messages is by downloading the Way Media app from the Apple App Store or Google Play Store. By doing this, you'll be able to take these teachings with you wherever you go. Would you like to get in touch with us? Our number is 865-609-1385. Once more, that's 865-609-1385. 
feel free to call us with questions or to even ask for prayer. Please come back for another edition where Pastor Mark will continue his teaching through the book of Genesis. But next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.